Welcome to the Wild Ones podcast, episode 31. This is the show where we chat about bike stuff. I'm Jimmy, and this week I'm back with pro bike mechanic Nick and producer Emily. Hello, guys. How are you doing? Not bad yourself. What have you been up to? Uh, Bikepacking in Scotland. Nice. It was really cold. <laughs> I didn't expect it, but at least no wind and the sun was shining. Why so, were yeah. you not expecting it? It's Scotland in winter. Well, the weather said five degrees, and I got there and it was minus four. So, I mean, I don't know how the weather messed it up. To be honest, me, my preparation for five degrees would be the same as my preparation for minus four anyway. No, five degrees is practically summer. That's shorts shorts and summer jersey. For Ten you, degrees is shorts. Uh, five degrees is what I did. Base layer, long sleeve jersey, and just something like a windstopper. Obviously, that didn't work out very well for me. But yeah, it's good. Right, so I've got a question for you both. On a scale of one to ten... How much do you enjoy those little free packets of Haribo that you get when you order stuff online, like from Wiggle? Oh, solid 9.8. Love them. I love Haribo, but I've never gotten a packet of Wiggle. Well, yeah, you don't order stuff from no. Wiggle, surely. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a bike shop. Why would he? <laughs> well, this week we finally learned the true cost of those sweets. It was revealed that online retailer Wiggle owed Haribo over £20,000 at the point that they went into administration. <laughs> It's, it's, it seems weird that a bike company would own Haribo 20 grand. It's absolutely bonkers, isn't it? I wonder how much one of those single packets costs. It's got to be pennies, hasn't it? Must be pennies, yeah. Surely they're getting a bulk discount. Yeah. So that's a lot of sweets. That's a lot of sweets. We've talked a lot about Wiggle already, so we won't dwell on it too long. But the administrator's report showed that they owed creditors a total of £26.7 million pounds that's uh, UK Distributor Madison and Extra UK were owed about a million pounds each. Garmin are owed 850 grand. Science in Sport, 660 grand. POC, about 500 grand. Seller Italia and Endura, about 400 grand. The list goes on. Apparently, some of the debts have now been paid in full, but that is a huge amount of debt. So I can only imagine what impact that has on some of the smaller businesses that they are working with. That's... Huge amounts of money. It seems like huge amounts, but perhaps that's normal in any given month. Maybe they're always, maybe they've just got massive lines of credit because they're so big. They definitely will have big lines of credit for sure. Yeah. Elsewhere in the news, Road CC has been asking, what is the ultimate winter bike? They reckon it's a gravel bike rather than a road bike modified for winter. So Nick, this is clearly something you've got a lot of experience with in that you've sold God knows how many bikes, winter ones, summer ones, every type of bike you can possibly manage. And so let's jump into this a little bit. Um, firstly, if you're relatively new to cycling, what is a winter bike? I suppose, obviously, we've got listeners from all over the world listening to it. But in countries like England and that have more extreme winters, generally people have bikes that put up with the salt on the roads a bit better. Something you ride during the, the bad weather months. Yeah, ultimately winter is uh, definitely for us wet, muddy. Even if you only ride on road, it's still muddy. There's, like you said, there's salt on the road. Uh, so a lot of definitely road cyclists, well, not a lot of, but some road cyclists will have two bike, two bikes. They have their nice fancy summer bike that they pull out when the weather's a bit better or just in the summer months and then something a bit more durable and hardy for the rest of the year. Um, it's definitely something I've done yeah. a lot of historically. We were discussing this the other week and I think um, it's died down a little bit. And I think it's happened since disc brakes. Back with rim brake days, if you had carbon wheels, they don't stop as well in the wet um, as alloy wheels. So people for winter used to switch over to the alloy wheels, which are generally on their winter bikes. Yeah. Um, but now with disc brakes, you've got the consistency. So I think more people are actually riding the good bikes through the winter. I do. It's becoming more normal. I mean, I remember being told off by a guy at a cafe four years ago for riding carbon wheels in winter. I guess if, if it, like you said, though, if it's, if it's carbon wheels, but they're disc brakes, then it's still going to be perfectly fine. Yes, but you have to take in consideration um, salt. Salt on the roads isn't good for your bike. So as long as you wash your bike after every ride on the roads, even if it's dry out, because there's still going to be salt on them, um, you can look after a bike a bit better. But there's arguments for winter bikes as well. Back in the day, it was a thing of, you ride your heavier winter bike with all the extra accessories and tools and things you would need for the winter on it uh, to kind of have your training block over winter. And when summer came, when you switched back to your summer bike, it might have been a bit of psychology involved in it, but 
all of a sudden just feels a bit more lively and kind of ready to go. My good friend and historic training partner, Ben Wickham, is a huge, huge, huge believer in this. So he's a, ty- he's a, he's a triathlete. Uh, his race bike is obviously a super, super high-end triathlon TT bike. And then all of his winter riding would be on a specialized alley, like a, like a, you know, a 15 year old alley with like the cheapest group set he can get on it. The cheapest wheels, just the, just the heaviest, most, um, juxtaposed bike you can possibly get to his race bike. So that, and he's all, as he's doing all of his winter training on that bike, he's thinking about, well, when I get on my TT, it is going to be like light. It just feels better. I mean, I, I did the same, um, Growing up in South Africa, Pretoria, where I grew up, we've got no winter rainfall. So winter months, arguably, it's, it's dry. So it's, it's a perfect weather to train in. But we still train. We even did it during the week. So you would, you have a training bike, and your racing bike only came out for races. Actual actual race Actual bike. races. And it kind of like makes it feel, which is a bit of a waste of a bike, if you think about it, because you're not getting to enjoy it. So now I'm kind of using my gravel bike for everything. Um, if I had to rebuy a bike for winter, it would be a gravel bike. So let's let's run through it then. So we're going to discuss what the ultimate winter bike setup is, and I know we are going to have differing opinions on it. Um, so let's start off with, top of the list, material. What material is your winter bike going to be made from? Titanium. I knew you were going to say titanium. Uh, titanium is just always going to win. It doesn't rust, doesn't corrode. There's no risks. Uh, even... Steel eventually will corrode unless it's stainless steel, but stainless steel itself isn't... It's probably more expensive than titanium these yeah. days. <laughs> and it's not corrosion-proof either. Um, alloy is going to eventually cause you problems. It's not uh, Alloy is a good, cheap option, but if you... Like James just figured out, his uh, current frame's lasted five years, and now it's just become really flexing, giving him problems. Mm. Carbon... D- the caveat to that is he's a brute on a bike. Yes. He rides an offensive amount of miles... And he rides in all conditions, all weathers. Granted, he maintains his bikes fantastically because he works in a bike shop. No, he doesn't. <laughs> all right, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> he works in a bike shop, but doesn't maintain them. Okay. But yeah, like five years to him is probably 15 years to a normal person. Yes. Uh, yeah, he's, I mean, it's, 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 he's harsh on the bike. But yeah, um, carbon is a problem if your carbon's got alloy bonded into it or other materials sometimes. Um, so titanium is is carbon a problem for winter it's not is it if you look after the bike but there are some bikes where you've got your bottom bracket shells are bonded in alloy bonded into the carbon but if it's if it's like a full carbon frame it should be it should make an all right winter bike i want to say yes in theory but you, you're always going to have problems because if it's a full carbon bike generally it's going to have um press fit bottom bracket yeah so that'll start creaking eventually um and i mean i'm not yeah It'll it work. You can do it. I mean, I've done it for years and years, but it's not in terms of if we're talking about what's the best. Titanium is still going to come out the best. I think, and I hate to say it, I'm going to agree with you. If I was buying, and I've actually considered recently, now I've started, I, so so my new house now where I live, or it's not new, it's six months. Uh, we are like super comfortable there. We're probably going to spend the le- rest of our lives there. I found a little local loop that I really enjoy doing. And already doing it over the last two months or whatever it is, I'm like, oh, this is putting a lot of dirt and crap into my like my, my summer bike. And I'm already going like, maybe I should get a, a proper winter bike. I think as much as I love steel, I think I would get a titanium bike yeah, it's, for a winter bike setup. I've been, it's been busy and I'm not good at washing my bike. I've done this bike packing trip and my bike's parked up in in the house has not been washed in a few days and it's, it's with it, any other bike would have been right but because i've got a titanium bike i've got enduro's xd15 bearings all throughout it just won't ever wear out there's no worry um i'll wash it tomorrow and the bike will just be good to go a bit of chain lube off it's just for ease of use and you don't have to worry about it if you look after your bikes all the time then it's not a massive issue what you ride right group set what are you putting on it so you so uh, so actually so we've picked a material. Let's pick a style of bike. Are you gonna get a gravel bike or a road bike? Gravel bike. Because of clearance, tire clearances. So you can ride it on road. You can ride it off road. But also in winter, off road is just sometimes nicer. 
you can hide from the elements a bit better. Uh, up here, we've got most of the disused railway lines are protected from the wind. Um, you're slightly a bit more protected from the cars and all the gray dark air because winter we've got less sunlight. So you're not riding, it's just, you, you've got options. You can ride on the road, but you can ride off-road as well. Where if you had a road bike, you're not riding off-road. But if you had a gravel bike already, yeah, and you wanted a winter bike, you would get an additional gravel, gravel bike. bike yes. Interesting. I think I would buy a gravel bike, but I would set it up as a road bike. But I like the I because I would because I'd want I would want mud guards on it, which we'll come to in a moment. We won't discuss that yet. But I wouldn't want to put mud guards on it that could accommodate massive tires because right. it's just overkill. So I would have a gravel bike set up as a road bike with mud guards yeah. and road wheels, road tires. Bigger tires. Yeah, big tires. Not but, massive, but, but like yeah, 35 like, mil tires. Exactly, so, yeah. yeah. With a bit of a bit of grip on them, but not gravel tires. Um, but I would do it as a gravel bike because it just gives me more options. If I decide I never want to ride a road bike in the winter again, I can strip it and I, I rebuild it as a proper gravel we're bike. We're using the term gravel bike too loosely. It's a big tire clearance bike. Yes. Because traditionally road bikes had 28 mil tire clearance. It yeah. is now, over the last two years, changing where quite a few road bikes have up to 35 mil a tire clearance and some will go even bigger still going forward but that, we, when we say gravel bike we mean a bike that can take at least 35 mil tire clearance exactly yeah. and have space for a bit of like dirt and stuff to not rub all the paint off your bike as soon as yeah i would i want anything. i would want 35 or 38 mil tires that are basically slicks but like maybe a little bit of a tread pattern but not a gravel tread and then proper mud guards, and therefore that means there needs additional clearance as well. And the likelihood is that in this day and age, that means I would buy a titanium gravel bike for that to be able to work. And this is obviously, if we're being very wasteful and buying loads of bikes, if you could just buy one bike, that could still do everything you needed to do. Exactly. Group set, what group set are you putting on it? Electronic. Yeah, specific. Just less, less corrosion. So SRAM's wireless group set works incredibly well for me, the, the gravel specific ones. Um, I'd run one by, once again, you just want less moving parts on the bike. Um, and lastly, if I didn't have any of that, I'd go 8-speed Shimano. Why? 8-speed Shimano is uh, tolerance for shifting. It's just better. It's more durable. It just lasts. You don't have to worry about it. It's not expensive. Um, what, what's an example of 8-speed eight eight, eight Shimano these days? Uh, they change like, every year. Uh, it used to be Olivio. And then it was a Sierra, I want to say. I it, I, to be honest, is this, I, is this specifically eight speed, or you, or, or do you ultimately just mean like uh, an entry level? No, specifically eight speed. So from six speed, seven speed, eight speed, they didn't change the chains. It's the same chain, same chain thickness. Um, six, seven, eight speed, same. So it's just said, so you've got six speeds durability, but you've got eight speeds gears. I can see the cogs working in your brain over there. Yeah. So when they went from eight <laughs> speed to nine speed, they made the chains thinner. They made right. the cassette spacings thinner. Then 10 speed, obviously that became even more, 11 speed more, 12 speed, but eight speed right. had the same as six speed. So, so you're ultimately saying that because there's less speeds, everything's a bit beefier and therefore yeah. it's more durable. So I would, I would want an electric group set because shifting electric gears, especially when you've got big fat gloves on and your hands are cold and they don't work properly is just a dream. Unless you're riding DI2, and then you've got a massive problem trying to hit those buttons with your big gloves. Unless you ride one by and you have it SRAM set up left and right. Yeah, I suppose. Can you actually do on. that? I, I, I keep meaning to do that on my gravel bike. I should know this. I'm pretty sure you can. You must I be able actually, to. I haven't tried it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, well, I'll, I'll try and work it out and let you know. Um, but yeah, like electric shifting, if it, if it was viable, because yeah, like I said, it's just it's just easier to do in when your hands don't want to work properly. Um, but if not, I would go cheap. Yeah. So the, the only thing I wouldn't go eight speed anymore is, is it's the the disc brake and the electronic gears. If they can make me a disc brake electronic eight speed group set, I'd be incredibly happy. Oh, that's a point. So you actually wouldn't be able to put that on then. Well, you can if you had a bike that can fit. Oh, actually, no. Like... So you would just you would have no. You you wouldn't. So, so, because assuming you're buying, an, you would be getting a modern bike, and therefore that group set wouldn't fit wouldn't on work. It. Yes. So actually, that doesn't work. So it would have to be like a Tiagra or a Sora or Shram maybe Apex. a 105. Yeah, that's a good group set. Uh, wheels. I, I, to be honest, I would do I, I like mid or, or shallow depth carbon carbon wheels 
on disc brakes are just like a for me are just a that's just the way it is now. So I would just put a bog standard, you know, Zip 303S or Parkours, Alters or whatever they are. Just something that's got a nice wide rim, is has a reputation for being good with tubeless and is going to be durable. The, the the benefit of something like Zip is they have a lifetime warranty now, do yeah. they? So, so, you know, you've got that to back it up as well. Not in the bearings though. So I think the most important thing for winter wheels is to find something with sealed um, cartridge bearings where you can just knock them out and put new ones in. Yeah. Um, that's the most important thing to look for. Other than that, you know, start looking at nipple choice because that's going to corrode Ooh. eventually. Um, you're going to have to start looking at depth is really important. I think if you live somewhere it's windy, so shallow is better. Yeah. I would like a wider internal rim width so you can fit bigger tires without having it. Um, how's, how do I say it? Like when you pump it up, if it's low pressure and you're going uphill, you don't want the tire to feel like a squidgy while riding. Yeah. So a slightly wider internal rim width does help with bigger tires. Um, so my ultimate wheel for this would probably be Mavic's new All Roads. Right. Because they do them 650B and 700C. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Are, you, are you going 650 or 700 for your winter setup? For road bike, 700 for me. But is it a road bike? Because you've already said it's a gra- you've picked a gravel bike and you want the versatility. Yeah, but we, 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 and the topic is all round winter bike to ride it on the road. It would have to be 700 700C for that. If you're yeah. riding on the road a lot, yeah. Tires? Tires. Tires is a difficult one. Um, I don't know the exact temperature, but as a few years ago, it became a big thing with winter tires. Certain rubbers become really hard and not malleable enough to kind of work properly below five degrees, I think it is. So you need to pick a tire that's actually going to work in cold conditions if your winters are below five. Um, you want something that's slightly grippy, slightly more puncture resistant because you don't want to be stuck next to the road um, if something goes wrong. Well, I've got a set of tires on my road bike that you or James sold me from Backyard. I can't remember what that... So, so basically, I went bikepacking with Francis in Spain. God, it might even be two Novembers ago now, I think it is. It's two years ago. Um, and I had, uh, by my choice, is it... Vittoria tires that have got the yellow amber walls. Is that the ones that I always used to get? Courses, yeah. It is Vittorias, yeah, yeah. isn't it? And they are so slippery. I remember what descending down some of the stuff in Spain in November, but it was still, you know, it, it was Spanish winter, but it was still sun out in 15 degrees. And the back end of the bike was sliding all over the place. And then I did a training ride in the Pennines uh, shortly before or shortly after. And I remember going up a really steep climb out the saddle and it was slipping out all over the place. And then you or James, can't remember which one of you said, ah, you don't want those, you want these instead. I feel like they might even be Michelin tires. So Michelin Krillian 2s, they don't make them anymore, but I still believe it's the greatest tire ever made. If, is that is that what they are? Yes. They um, are unbelievably good. So I, I, the, I think the, the company line back in the day when they started, the, the Michelin was very good at using um, their Moto GP rubber technology on their bicycle tires as well. Yeah. So it's just a really good rubber. Um, they last incredibly long, very puncture resistant, but the problem's been that they've discontinued them um, and they don't do tubeless anymore either. But yeah, that is my favorite all time. If they bring out, if they were to bring out a tubeless version of that now, I'd probably be the only tire stock in the shop. It is so good. It, yeah, it wasn't expensive either. I mean, I think full retail was 35 pounds and we were selling them for 15 quid a tire. Yeah. It, honestly, it's like, it is just the best road tire I've ever used. Yes. There's just so much grip on it and it isn't, it's really grippy, but it also isn't, it's like wearing well. Yeah, it's not just like disintegrating. It's got no tread on it. It's a perfectly smooth tire, but it's yeah. just show you don't actually on the road need tread. You just need, it's a rubber compound that's important. Yeah. Uh, so I would get more of them, but I can't. So I don't know. I, ultimately, my tire choice would be, like I said earlier, 35 mil, maybe even 38 tubeless road tire um that's got a good reputation i'm actually not that precious about how puncture resistant they are because it, you know if, if i was riding it on the road i would hope that the setup and the tubeless would get me through most things yeah and, tubeless has changed everything so you don't need something that's massively yeah like the old days i would it would be like a uh, gator skin or um i used to use specialized armadillos which then they changed and became rubbish but originally they were amazing I, i'd pick a tire that's High volume, so you can run slightly lower pressures with good sealant in it. What are you putting on then? Or tires. Yeah. Um, Terravale Rampart in a 35 mil, I reckon, is the tire to go for. There we go. 
Um, so I said earlier I, I was going to mention mud guards. I 100% would put mud guards on, and they would be fully fitted ones, preferably uh, alloy ones rather than plastic. But plastic would be fine as long as it was a nice shape. And I put a big fat flap on the back of it as well, and a big fat flap on the front to get as much water off me and the bike as possible. And I know you're going to get very upset about this, but that is what I would do, and it is exactly what I want to do. I don't understand what the flaps and mud. The rain comes from the sky, not from the ground. Yeah, but it splashes up. You clearly, Splash you up. clearly spent too much time so, riding so in South Africa as a junior. What's the rear flap for then? Well, that's meant to be for people behind you. You don't ride with anybody else. That's for me. Emily, you're much faster than Jimmy. You'll be riding <laughs> ahead of him. So like, I can understand putting on Emily's bike, not well, the, yours. The, the, rear, the rear flap <laughs> is is meant to be for other people uh, in the group, but I just like the look of it. Okay, so just the front ones for me. Full disclaimer over here, I am no expert when it comes to mud guards because Clearly. I'm South African and I never rode in the rain ever. Um, so we don't even fit mud guards in the shop or give advice on it just because we're not qualified. But from what I've seen of the bit and bikes coming into the shop with mud guards on, with mud guards, people tend to clean their bikes. Sorry, don't tend to clean their bikes properly. Oh, okay. So interesting, bikes are yeah. maintained a lot worse because yeah. it's much harder to clean a bike with mud guards on. Mm-hmm. There might True. be a few people that find a way around, but in general, from what we've seen in a bike shop, Bikes with mud guards are always the components. Everything's in worse condition. So there's probably also the false sense. Well, ultimately, like if you finish a bike with mud guards, most of the dirt is hidden. Yeah. So you go like, well, it's fine. I'll just put it in. The, I'll put it, put it away and forget about it. And there, whereas my bike, I've ridden a couple of times without washing it, and it's notice. It's got noticeable road splatter all over it, and I'm like, oh, I should clean it. If I had mud guards, it would look spotless still. The other thing is that. Fully fitted mud guards, just fitted like tight clearances and things like that, sprays all the dirt straight back onto all your components. Yeah. Arguably your rear mech, your front mech, uh, bottom bracket and things like that, your hubs. Where if you use something like a arse saver wind wing or just a normal one, that'll keep you dry. Obviously it doesn't help uh, Jimmy sitting behind you, Emily, but um, it doesn't spray everything directly down back onto your bike. So I that's I prefer them. Um, I know it doesn't help anybody else, but it helps me stay dry. It works it, really well. It's an unexpected point of view. I'd never considered the idea that actually a mudguard might increase the wear on your bike. The, the only thing a mudguard helps is your headset. Well, and you. Yeah, I'm talking for a bike. Yeah, yeah. So I used to I used to have a, a road bike with mudguards when I lived in London, specifically for commuting. It was a commuter bike. And I used to commute in all weathers, all conditions, all year round. I used to take about two weeks off. If, if it snowed or it was icy, I would take about two weeks off. But in London, that was basically never because it never got cold enough to actually be icy. Um, and the main point of the mud guards was, well, bef- the reason I got them initially is I'd be riding home. I'd get absolutely drenched when it was raining, mostly from splash. Because even if it's not raining, if it has rained you're just getting soaked from splash up. So I was like, well, if I get full mud guards, it's going to stop. It's going to mean I'm drier and therefore I'm more likely to commute and it be less unpleasant. And that was why I did it. And it worked in that respect. But then, yeah, perhaps there's more maintenance involved as a result of that. Do you know what the bane of my life is when it comes to winter riding is cut out saddles? Because oh, yeah. even with an ass saver on, it doesn't quite cover the length of the cutout. And you just literally have your your wheel is just spraying water up into your chamois pad constantly. It's like having a it's bidet. It's like sitting yeah. in a wet nappy all the time. I end up putting just like a, a bit of gaffer tape or sellotape or something like that under the thing. But inevitably, by the end of the ride, that starts dripping off. Well, th- you just I need th- a little like insert to clip back into it. I, th- I think some saddle manufacturers now do saddle uh, gravel versions of their saddles. <laughs> Which oh, do they? have covers. You've got the groove, but it's still sealed at the bottom. <laughs> right. Well, that's what yeah. I want, but I, I refuse I used to, to buy another use a, one. A, a saddle bag yeah. specifically just to block that out. Yeah. The other thing that's very typical of a winter bike is you have front and rear lights on it basically all of the time. Um, and like, well, in my opinion, I was al- I always use a frame pump, but if you are going to use a frame pump at any time, it should definitely be winter because you're going to just, if you have to repair a puncture, you're going to get back on the road quicker. So generally for winter, I use one bottle rather than two. And then my other bottle, I have all of my spares on because it's just easier to get access to them. On my summer bike, I usually have a saddle bag because they're just a bit more fiddly to get in and out of, which if you're cold and on the side of the road, you want less fiddle. 
So usually I have something much more accessible in my second bottle cage, a frame pump, uh, lights on all of the time. But for me, I do that most of the time on en- on all of my bikes anyway. That's one of the reasons I love uh, tubeless now as well for winter bike riding. Because like I said, when you're cold, it's a hassle being stuck there doing things. If I've got a puncture that doesn't seal, dyno plug, pop off the cap, stab it in, pull it out, pump my tie up, off I go. The, but I guess I guess the that is because you have good wheels with a good tire combination. Yeah, yeah. Because if because there there will be people and there'll be a lot of people that have tire and wheel combinations that aren't very compatible. So they're going to get a puncture. It's going to end up unseating, and then they're not going to be able to fix their puncture. Whereas I think what's happened over the last three, four, five years is... It's less than that. I would say two years. It, the, the combinations are getting better and they're becoming more... There's more knowledge around which ones work well together. Yeah. And I think the, the bit a lot of people are scared of tubeless, and I was definitely one of those people, is... It would have been when we first moved up. So 2019, 2020 and doing gravel rides on, I've already got a set of wheels that are technically tubeless compatible, and then I get them set up tubeless, and they just don't work very well together, and you end up having to stuff a tube in. Whereas what you have fine-tuned over the last however many years is you know which tire and wheel combinations are just going to work perfectly, and therefore you know you're going to be able to dyno plug it pretty much every time, pump it up, you're back on the road, no issues. I think that's that's probably the biggest problem we've got in the shop where people come in and they just die hard, doesn't work. Or one of their friends told them, and I get it. Um, I had a customer in last week with a set of Bontrager wheels and a set of GP5000, the first edition they launched, the non-hookless version. And it took me half an hour and I couldn't get the wheels and the tubeless to work. The order a used tire, but it just would not take. We double taped the rim. We then triple taped the rim. We did everything. It just would not inflate. Um, but then... We've done videos in here where we've used the newer GP five thousands on zips, and we pumped it up with a hand pump from flat to seating it up, and it's just easier. So it's it's just a thing of first lead was wheel sizes, tire sizes, and compatibility, and now sealants, better sealants coming around that just works a lot better. Yeah, um, yeah. So obviously, I I understand that if if you don't have the right stuff, it's not going to be easier. But if you've got it, it just makes life a lot easier. In winter for people who don't want to buy a dedicated winter bike what maintenance should they be doing should it be regular washing lubing I'll, and not mud guards or once again it? if there's salt on the roads where you're riding after every single ride wash your bike wash it wash it properly degrease the chain lube it it's i know it's labor intensive but it's going to save you so much money in the long run by not having to do you need to dry everything. it as well um if you're storing it in a shed so if you if you're living in your kitchen or inside your house, then generally no, because it's 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 a dry environment. But if you if you're living in a shed or in a garage that's humid or wet, it's never going to dry by itself. Um, so yeah, then you'd have to dry it, or you, you can say lube it or use something like G thirty five, but that's just going to cause you problems. So you get on your brake pads. So yeah, it's 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 as simple as wash your bike. So the message here is, wash your bike if you want it to last. And that actually applies all year round, really, but especially prevalent in well, winter. Well, bizarrely, no, actually, um, we, we have a problem with some customers that overwash your bikes. So in summer, if you were to wash it too much and you don't lube it or they pressure wash it, they actually take all the grease out of their bikes. And then because it's summer, they don't think about it. And that causes an issue. But that's washing technique being the issue. True, true, true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now on to our big question, or should I say questions, because this week we're going to play a game that we're calling Love, Tolerate, Kill. I'm going to list three things, for example, SRAM, Shimano, or Campag, and you're going to have to pick which one you love, which one you tolerate, and which one you'd kill off entirely if you could. So it's basically snog, marry, avoid, but we're changing it up because no one wants to imagine you snogging group sets, even though I've caught you doing it before in the shop. (laughs) Uh, So first up, in love, tolerate, kill, we are going to do that example, SRAM, Shimano, Campag. Which one do you love, which one do you tolerate, and which one would you kill off? This is a hard one because it's, it's dependent <laughs> on my stage of my life and stage of what they are uh, producing. So if you asked me 10 years ago, it was die hard, never loved anything more, would have tattooed it on my chest, Campag. It's not even 10 years ago because when I first met you, which is like yeah. five years, four, five, six, whatever it is, years ago, 
you were just like, you have to get a Campag group set and you have to get a Chinelli bike. You were like <laughs> Mr. Italy when it comes to, I to just, bikes. I, I, I loved Campag so much. From the first day I started riding a bike, I loved it. I loved it more than anything. Um, I would have tolerated Shimano back then and I hated Shram. Um, really just didn't like it. I didn't like the double tap. Uh, personal preference. And I think it's what you get used to and the way it worked. I, I Did you know what? I'm exactly the same as you. So 10 years ago, I had Campag and I, I thought it was gorgeous. I raced on Shimano because it just worked better and I wouldn't ever have even considered uh, SRAM. Although SRAM at that time was the lightest group set, but it was so expensive that I was just like, oh, I want it because I was obsessed with weight, but it's so expensive. I'm not, I'm just going to get my, my Shimano deal on Wiggle. Yeah, I, I was stubborn as well, I think, because SRAM was something new back then that it wasn't, yeah. Now, if you ask me, I love SRAM. I love SRAM more than anything. Um, I'm enjoying it more. It just works. It's just with years and years and years of doing stuff, it just works better. Uh, I know loads of people disagree with. I can tolerate Shimano at the moment just because they make a good product. I feel that some of their business practices are dubious and for me and the durability isn't there. And I hate Campag at the moment. You hate them? Yes. Good job. Oh, you didn't get that tattoo. Oh, I hate, sorry. I'd kill off Campag. <laughs> I know it's a good thing. At the moment, and the reason is that they just do, it's, it's just slower to progress. And the new groups are so expensive, the wireless groups. It uses two different batteries. Um, last Was it last year or the year before they tried to sell me the new gravel wheels they made? And it's got open ball bearings. And I told them that doesn't last up here. And I got told, uh, just think how much money you can make servicing the wheels for customers. <gasps> and I was like, that's just not a actual way of it's doing things. Because you, you, you're not... I can't sell somebody a set of wheels for over a thousand pounds and then have to service them every two or three months to keep them on. They'll never buy anything off me again. Um, and yeah, so that's... That's a terrible sales pitch from them, isn't it? I know. It? Well, it wasn't from Campag. That was from the rep. Right. I'm with you. I'm kill on Campag because they're just so... They're absolutely... They are without a doubt the most beautiful group set yeah. out of all of the group sets. Top end Campag group sets are just beautiful. They're just beautiful. Um, if I was going to build a beautiful bike to put on a, on a wall, it would probably have Campag yeah, on it. I'm I, never going to do that. I would though. still buy a 12-speed super record mechanical group set, room brake. Yeah, 100%. I love it. Yeah, for a room brake bike is Campag, 100%. I, I wish they can turn around. Um, I feel now that Wiggle is gone or going or what's happening with Wiggle, um, I hope Campag can come back and actually start looking after the small bike shops again. Forget about the big onlines because those are the people that built them over the last 50 or 60 years was traditional bike shops come back and help them do more things speak to them see what they want don't just randomly make things without actually discussing it with bike shops and turn around but at the moment it's yeah it's kill i'm kind of torn between sram and shimano at the minute because i like sram i like shimano i've got I've used both of their group sets pretty extensively across all of their mid to top end range. Uh, that's like, well, that's most of their group sets, especially with the stuff that we've been doing with Cade Media over the last 12 months or however long it is. Um, I was a massive SRAM fanboy over the last probably two years, probably influenced by you quite significantly. I've used some more Shimano stuff recently and I'm really enjoying it. Or, or more, I mean, what I hadn't used until more recently was Shimano Di2 stuff, and the Di2 is very good. So I'm a bit torn, and I think for the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to tolerate SRAM and love Shimano. It's, it's, I, I love a new Shimano as well, but my, my thing from in the bike shop is after about six months or nine months, especially with the gravel group, say it's ride the bike, it just never works again like it did originally, and that's my problem with it. Next one is DI2, ETAP, and mechanical shifting. I want to say kill mechanical shifting. Uh, really? Yes, love DI2, tolerate ETAP. But I do love mechanical shifting. However, if I have the opportunity to never own a mechanical shifting bike again, apart from a like uh, retro, modern sexy steel bike build like my moss bike then that should still have mechanical rim brakes on it like it does surely you can't get rid of mechanical shifting like it works fine it's less expensive like talking about bikes for the masses well yeah i know but like 
I, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm converted to electric shifting because it's lush. Oh. It is proper lush. Oh. But Spoiled. Uh, well, yeah, yes. what I always, what yes, I always that's said. That's true, but it, yes. it's, I, I can't deny it. Um, so I think w we need to stop thinking of groups as specific. Let's just think of the way it works. Uh, it's 100% love eat up because it's fully wireless and the batteries are interchangeable and easily sorted. We're going to have to tolerate DI2 because electronic shifting is still good, but the battery is internal, which causes you issues if it dies on a ride because you can't carry a spare. Um, and the shifters with the two buttons being close to each other is terrible. And we're going to have to kill mechanical shifting because eventually it's gone. We killed off the penny farthing. No. We are going to kill off mechanical <laughs> shifting eventually. I refuse to believe it. It's just one of those things. It's... There are some good mechanical shifts back. Nine-speed Euro Ace, beautiful group set. Ten-speed Record Titanium, beautiful group set. All eight-speed group sets just worked really well. Eleven-speed was a bit of a failure across the board. It would have worked well when it was new, and then eventually the mechanical just went wrong um, with pivot play and things like that. Corrosion, cables. Yes, people talk about simplicity of things, but as technology goes, electronics, having charged stuff, Sorry, having to charge things, it's just easier. Um, fixing your bike, home mechanics is going to become easier. It's much more simplified telling people, click a button. There's apps now to tell you how to set your gears. To, to be fair, eTap is bonkers easy to like use. And like you could literally move your mechs from one bike to another and it not be an there, issue. There was a, st a thing back in the day that said it takes 15 minutes to switch an eTap group set from one bike to another bike um, if you didn't have to cut hydraulic hoses. Yeah. That was uh, that was a rim brake version, I think. Yeah. Um, titanium carbon alloy. Titanium. What? What about it? Just titanium. Oh, sorry, <laughs> love titanium. Uh, love titanium. For the environment, I'm going to say kill carbon, tolerate alloy. Alloy is recyclable. Carbon's not. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of riding, I would say tolerate carbon, kill alloy. Uh, love titanium on every aspect there is. There's nothing that you can't love it for. I'm for this one. I am kill carbon, love alloy, tolerate titanium. Alloy is uh, cheap. It works really well. The only thing I don't like about it is if you write it off, it's written off. Yes, you like you. Well, you can recycle the material presumably, but in terms of uh, once you crack the bike, it can't be repaired as far. I've never known anyone. I've never heard of anything about alloy bike repair. It's like once it's cracked, it gets really Yeah, off. it's just gone. But also, I think with time, your alloy bike will become softer. But to crack it in the first place is quite hard. It's harder to, to write off an alloy bike than it is to write off a carbon bike, in my opinion. Yes, but uh, an alloy bike will deteriorate with time. How much you ride it is going to depend on how quickly. But um, it still, but yeah. still works. But like I say, it's, for me, it's more of a, at the moment, it's more of a thing of kill carbon because of, I understand it's innovative, but in terms of what's the end game here? What do we do with carbon? I think Silk has found a way to take the resin out and cut it down to make tubular sealant, but it's still like, yeah, that, that's, that's my standpoint on it. It's not a, a thing of... It's unnecessary, better, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, like, unnecessary. like, for example, in cars... You only see carbon in cars when they're like uber expensive race cars at the top, top end. The stuff that we are driving every day are just, you know, made of alloy and yeah. steel and, well, metals. So, like, it seems unnecessary for us to be on carbon bikes, apart from the fact we're obsessed with weight. Can I just say as well, on the topic of environment and unnecessary things, because I know we will get it in the comments, the electronic shifting obviously creates a reliance on energy, which mm -hmm. is very... Un environmentally friendly so i'm just putting it out there because i know every time we talked about this before it's unnecessary it's and it creates a reliance on electricity but mechanical gear cables and outer housing that's cased in plastic yeah. we'll go through a lot more than that than through batteries i have in the as a bike shop oh but there's there is no way that those plastic outers have a larger environmental impact than batteries and the charging the of those batteries yeah. every single time you need to so, gravel road time trial. Oh, kill time trial. <laughs> What's the point in that? Oh, it's I, not fun. I love time trial. You just suffer trial. and you hurt. No, um, definitely kill time trial. Uh, tolerate road because uh, it's still enjoyable to do. Love gravel. So, 
if in a figurative environment whereby if I rode on the road, there was never, ever, ever any issues with cars. Oh, yeah, if definitely. it was as safe to ride on a road as it was to ride off-road in terms of accidents with ve other vehicles and other road users, mine would be kill gravel, love road, tolerate time trial. And I, and I know that sounds bonkers, but it's because road riding is the best thing in the world. It is unbelievably amazing. It feels wicked. The bike flow. I just, I, I'm obsessed with it. I love it. However, I don't do it as my primary riding because I'm always thinking about Do you enjoy the road because of the thrill of the speed and things like that? Well, it's, it's not even, it, it isn't even just about the, the thrill of the speed. It's just, it just flows. It's just everything. It just moves. It flows. You don't have to pedal continuously yeah, because of the not use resistance. your brakes on a gravel bike and then you've got that fear of death the whole time. And it, just... it isn't about fear of death. It's nothing to do with that. Yeah. Where time trialing is just pain and suffering. Oh, I love time trialing. I love it. I'm actually considering getting a time trial and bike again. No. Next up, we're going to go into some bike brands. Cannondale Trek Specialized. I kill all three. I know. <laughs> um, uh, love Cannondale. What? Uh, I hate some of the marketing stuff they do. I hate some of the uh, terrible choices and bottom brackets and things they do. But they make a beautiful bike. And they do every now and then paint schemes and they just they've got some classic bikes back in the day Mario Cipollini's red with the yellow the Seiko team 20 to 30 years ago Cannondale were yeah the perfect bike brand I have never thought of a specialized being a nice looking bike until some of the modern stuff looks yeah. nice the more plain things they do um don't ask me to name them but yeah so I'll tolerate specialized for that um and I'll kill Trek for the fact that they still do the crazy stuff that Cannondale does. Um, and you, you mean like weird proprietary stuff, I'm guessing? Yeah, weird proprietary, stupid breaks in the dome, that seat post nonsense of theirs. On, <laughs> It's just, um, yeah, the massive branding on the side. I, I personally just don't like it. Should we move on to the next one? Uh, so these are all bike brands that Nick sells. Sato Tomasini Time. So Sato is an Italian custom carbon manufacturer they make them all in italy tomasini is a custom well actually they, i think they both do off the shelf as well but you can do custom on both tomasini is a steel italian bike manufacturer and time is a french carbon not custom carbon manufacturer that has a weave thing which is also like fesco which are a lot more expensive so there we go love tolerate kill go this is, this is like Ask me which one of my children you want me to kill off. Um, <laughs> which one I love most. You only have one child, don't you? Uh, luckily for you guys, or luckily for me, and luckily for you, I find a loophole in this one. Uh, I'm going to go <laughs> love time because the innovation and how they make their uh, frame sets. So they do, obviously, the, the how they weave the carbon um, on a loom. So, yeah, uh, innovation-wise, there's nobody close to them. So I'm going to have to say love that. Tolerate Sato. And I'm only saying tolerate Sato because they make unbelievable bikes, but the carbon is not the same as Times. So that's, that's the only reason. And then I could never kill Tomasini because Tomasini is my favorite bike brand of all time, but they're making an electric bike. So kill the electric Tomasini. What? what sort of we, we like e-bikes. I like e-bikes, but it's just not what Tomasini is about. Tomasini is about classic steel yeah. with Campo Group sets on it. But as a brand, I love Tomasini the most. <laughs> Wheels, Hunt, MV, DT, Swiss. Uh, kill Hunt, straight away. <laughs> um, don't even need to expand on that one. Uh, I love Envy um, and tolerate D Swiss. D Swiss always made a good wheel set, um, good quality, good engineering. They, used to, they make too many different things, maybe. Uh, Envy is just it's Envy. I love it. Um, they've been on the forefront of carbon fiber for wheels. They give you a lifetime warranty. Um, they look after their customers. Uh, Hunt. Hunt looks after the customers really well, but I just, from a bike shop, we've just had too many problems. Right. Next one is, oh, this is a great one. Uh, one by gearing, two by gearing, fixed gear. Does it have to be fixed gear or can it be single speed? Mm, it, fixed gear. Every, every bike's a single speed if you just don't change gears or your batteries <laughs> die. So no, not a single speed, it's fixed gear. Uh, love one by. 
Um, in this scenario, I'm going to tolerate fixed gear. I sold my fixie last week, but I do enjoy riding it. Um, and kill two by. <laughs> gonna kill you are gonna this yeah, you're gonna get some hate. Two by is just not necessary anymore. Now with twelve speed group sets. If you will to a yes, by all means make them the only two by groups that they can go race with. But the average person, there's enough gear range. This whole gear jump nonsense is not a thing anymore, in my opinion. Uh, one by is easier to explain to new people to ride bikes. So during pandemic sort of people that never owned bikes, you didn't have to explain to them about cross chaining or when to ride in the small cog went to ride in the big cog. It's just a thing of smaller gears at the back, makes you go a little bit faster, but it's harder to pedal. Big gears makes it easier to go uphill, but you go a bit slower. Simple as that. Your arguments are absolutely fantastic, but I still don't agree with you. <laughs> Fixed gear is going in the bin because it is the worst <laughs> thing in the world. I tolerate one by because there's some places that it makes sense, and I love two by. Fixed gear is just... Dead. The purity of it all. Get rid so of it. If you want a winter bike that you don't have to worry single about. Single speed, though. I love single no. speed. Pedal systems. Uh, Shimano SPD SL. So that's Shimano's road pedal system. Look, Kio, and speed play. So three different road systems. Very easy. Speed play for the win. No, speed play needs to be killed off. First thing, <laughs> gone. Get rid of speed play. It for is absolutely pointless. Uh, love Shimano SPD SL. It's just been always been a dependable, good road pedal. Tolerate Look here. Look makes an unbelievably good mountain bike pedal, but they don't have reliability when it comes to their road pedals. So I'm um, I'm killing Look. I tolerate Shimano SPD SLs. I hate. I get. I I've never really used them. So we've got the Garmin Rally road pedals. Is that what they're called? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which are obviously the same sort of system, um, which is a one-sided thing. And I, because I've just never really used that style of pedal, I'm like I'm like a proper noob when I use use them. You know, well, Francis and I will pull over on the side of the road to do like a hill section for a video, and I'm like fumbling trying to get into the pedal uh, because it's just new to me. You step in the dirt with your speed plays, and then you can't ride your bike anymore. And you well, have to I've get never stick to like right, so I, I've used speed plays for f probably pushing 15 years now, at least 10 years. And that has never, ever once been an issue for me, this is, ever. This is a terrible topic that Emily's put in here because we all know time is best for everything pedal-wise. <laughs> why, why am I standing in the dirt on a road ride? I don't know. Exactly. Roads are dirty up, yeah. Time <laughs> pedals all the way. Nice <laughs> on your knees. Yes, the cleats wear out quickly, but they're just so good. Uh, right, tires. Uh, oh, this is a great one. So Schwalbe Marathon Plus, Pan Racer Gravel Kings, and Continental Gator Skins. Which one do you love? Panaracer Gravel King for the love. Yep. Uh, Tolerate. Schwalbe Marathon Plus. And kill. Uh, Gator Skins. They're not grippy enough. For whatever reason, when it's wet, they are slippery tires. Yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm killing. In my opinion, for me personally, it's just it's too much of a risk. Uh, Schwalbe Marathon Plus tires, uh, your teeth are going to fall out because they're so hard, but they're very puncturous and they last forever. So I get there's a really good point for them. And then Panaracer Gravel Kings puncture incredibly easily. But with some sealant, you can probably offset that. And out of the three, they are the most supple and comfortable, meaning you can enjoy your ride more as faster. And that's why I love them. So I actually found story. Gravel Kings quite slippery as well. Not as slippery as Gator Skins. So I'm killing Gator Skins. I will tolerate Gravel Kings. And I love Marathon Plus because you can bang them on a bike and you can just forget that they're uh, even there. In the Panaracer's defense, I think it's the Gravel King SKs are slippery on tarmac. But the normal Gravel Kings, the smooth ones, are actually okay on tarmac i'll take your word for it time for another round of overrated or underrated i'm going to read out a list of things and you're going to tell me if you think they're overrated or underrated so first up we have rollers suggestion from carl who says i sold my trainer and got rollers instead and i can't go back easier to set up and takes a day to learn plus they keep you more focused on your pedaling i was going to say underrated but i'm going overrated as a training as a training device rollers don't work uh, in my opinion, um, as a to learn skills and to warm up before races, yes, it's much simpler because your bike drops on your right and it's good for skills. But to get fit, it's just not going to do the same as what a turbo trainer is going to do for you. I, I I personally think rollers are absolutely rubbish. Um, I used to race and I never used to warm up on rollers. I would just go and ride around the roads wherever I was, whether that's cyclocross or time trials or crit races, I would just go off of the circuit or quite often the circuits will give you the opportunity to warm up on them anyway. 
Um, so I would always just warm up like that. I've used rollers and I just don't get on with them. But on the subject of rollers, we have literally on Cade Media just dropped a video called I tried every tax indoor trainer to find out the best one. And Francis and I look at rollers along with a lot of the other tax range. Um, so maybe if you're interested in rollers or other turbo trainers, you should check out that video. They are really good for um, handling and confidence. Yeah, I think everybody should know how to ride I one. used to go to a, a women's skills class on a Tuesday night where we literally just rode on rollers for an hour and threw balls back and forth in a, in a circle to get our, I don't know, bike proficiency up. And it was really good. But but you didn't need to do that on rollers. You could have done it, done that session on a tennis court. Well, yeah, you could have just ridden a bike. Yes, and, you and could. They skills. did outside ones as well, but I think in the winter and stuff. Yeah, because I I actually have a I have the level one triathlon federation coaching certificate. I can't remember what it's actually specifically called. And part of the skills, the bike skills sessions is things like um, riding under. Like so, like limbo, but not like lean back limbo. Basically, going under like bars on your bike because it it it, you, it teaches you to kind of move your weight in different ways on the bike and and get down low and things like that. I mean, he says he sold his trainer and got rollers instead, and he wouldn't go back. So, I mean, if it works for you, it works for you, doesn't it? Yeah, fair. Uh, next up, drop a post on gravel bikes. So this is suggested by John in Redhill, who said, "I'm looking at getting my first gravel bike, and I wonder if it's worthwhile adding one." Hype or not worth it. I do love my dropper post on my mountain bike. Um, so I'm going to start here <laughs> and you can come in later. I have a very, I have a custom made steel gravel bike that is set up to be a proper gravel bike, i.e. nearly a mountain bike, but not quite. Uh, I had a dropper post on it and I just didn't ever use it. So I took it back off again. If you are from a mountain bike background, the chances are you're going to enjoy a dropper on a gravel bike. If you're from a road bike background getting into it, you're probably never going to think, oh, I need a dropper in this scenario, unless you ride with Nick Vieri, in which case you should be on a mountain bike anyway. <laughs> Proper post is underrated. Uh, I come from a full on road bike background. Didn't ride a mountain bike at all as a kid, apart from when I was really small and didn't have a road bike. But I wasn't a mountain bike. I rode my road mountain bike on the roads. Started riding gravel as my first foray into off-road riding. Got a dropper post and I can never go back. I actually miss my dropper post on my road bike now. Ridiculous. Because you descend faster. This is ridiculous. Anyway, it's, it's underrated. Most, it's the un most underrated product, not for gravel, for all bikes. <laughs> that's, 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 even, that is an outrageous statement. They should make a time trial dropper post so that like, <laughs> when you get in the descent, you can tuck even closer, get you know, like more aero. Imagine the gains. It'll be a whole new subsection of bikes Cannondale can come up to sell to people that they don't need. Next batch rule suggested by Chris. Um, bike bells or horns? Underrated. Every bike should have a bell on it. On our bike backing trip this weekend, my bell didn't work because of the way Josh Reed fitted my bar bag. I should have done it myself, maybe. Um, and Rob didn't have a bell because his bike aero handlebars can't take a bell. Um, and it was just it was just terrible having to shout people to like make them aware we were coming past them. It's just, I think it's, it's underrated. I think they're underrated as well. Um, when we were in London, I used to, I've got a really loud whistling technique. Um, so I used to whistle instead of having a bell. But what I found whilst, when we moved to the Northeast is people just assume that it's like a bird or something rather, <laughs> and they just ignore you. So you, up here, you have to have a bell because there's so much nature. Whereas in London, the whistle works really well. And usually the one in, I would use the whistle in London when pedestrians walk out in the road and you're trying not to hit I'm them. I'm just worried sometimes of coming across as rude or like, I've got a lad that we ride with that rings his bell repeatedly when he goes, and it just annoys me so much. Just ring it once or twice, make them aware. You don't want to like scare people out of the way. You just want them to know you're coming. Nighttime gravel is really good for this because the light is so bright that people no, you're coming from like four miles away. I didn't realize that you were ever concerned about being rude. <laughs> <laughs> Keep sending your suggestions to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk and we might read yours out on the next show. So next up, we have Fluff Up of the Week. Fluff up of the week. Do you want to do this one on me? I will do it and I will do it quickly. Um, listeners of last week's show probably wouldn't have noticed any problem however 
because I seamlessly edited it to edit out my mistake. However, we um, we filmed a bit, didn't we, at Christmas? When Francis was still here, we filmed a little bit that we were going to put into last week's episode, which was basically Jimmy starting the podcast saying, welcome, we're here with Emily and Francis. And Francis went, whoa, 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 wait a second, I'm not meant to be here, you're on your own, and, and was going to go off. And then you did a little click, and it was a transition to the next week, and then you're like, oh, a bit of magic. I'm joined by Nick. Welcome to the Wild Ones podcast, episode 30. This is the show where we chat about bike stuff. I'm Jimmy, and this week I'm joined by Francis and producer Emily. Oh, uh, wait. No, 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 no. What? I'm not supposed to be here. I'm getting a flight to go spend time with my family and stuff. Oh, yeah. See you later. I'm going to start with some New Year's magic and change my outfit. That's better. So this week I'm actually joined by pro mechanic Nick and producer Emily. Um, and the reason we did that is because we have some adverts for our show going out on Acast. Um, and we wanted to let people, because Francis was in that advert, so we wanted to let people know that Francis was the usual guest, but he wasn't here this week. However, what happened was I forgot to, no, I did press record on the microphones, but they didn't pick up any of the audio. For whatever reason. For whatever reason. Yeah. So we basically had really, really bad audio just coming out of the cameras that was so terrible we had to just scrap the whole thing and it meant we didn't really have a proper intro so I nicked an intro off a previous week and just put um for the video just put my face and your face in what so you couldn't see Jimmy wasn't actually speaking and I think it worked seamlessly I don't think he would have it noticed did. It very good however it would have it would have been very good but it couldn't happen so sorry and who's this Francis character <laughs> is he coming back <laughs> Now for more listeners takeover. So last week we discussed bike muggings, which are uh, upsettingly or becoming more common in the UK. Um, and we asked for other people around the world to send in some emails if they are also experiencing this kind of theft um, where, well, in this country, people have come at you with a bike and sometimes a machete and stealing your bike probably whilst you're on it. Uh, we've had emails from Australia, Canada, Philadelphia, and California, and they've all said that while thefts of bikes are quite high, they haven't experienced moped muggings. So what we can deduce from that, at least for the time being, is that it is a uniquely British problem that we're getting these moped bike muggings. If you wanted to know more about that, have a listen to last week's podcast because we go into it in quite a bit of detail. We also had a question from Henry. I got into cycling around the 2012 boom. I bought a standard entry-level road bike, a Rose Pro RS, in 2013 with an aluminium frame and a carbon fork, around the £900 mark at the time, and I've loved it ever since. The only significant upgrade it's had is the wheel set and tyres. My question, how long should I expect the frame to last? What are the signs it's deteriorating, and how should I expect it to deteriorate? slowly or all at once is it safer to replace after a certain age slash mileage or can i keep going and if i should replace it what's the ethical way to dispose of it i assume it's not cool to sell or give away a frame that might be unsafe if it helps it has been kept indoors and lovingly maintained all that time it still feels like new to me my mileage has been varied but around one to three k per year i would estimate a minimum of 12 kilometer or 12,000 miles in the time I've had it. It's been the best money I've ever spent and I will happily keep it going if I can. So when I was growing up in the bike shop, um, generally we were told uh, alloy bikes last five years. But at that point, I think the people aimed at that was back home, people doing about 400 to 500 kilometers a week. So that is a considerable amount of riding. So based on this, I think as long as the frame visibly looking at it doesn't have any bubbling or uh, corrosion um, or cracks forming with that kind of distance, that bike should last them quite a bit. As long as you look after it in terms of cleaning it, drying it, keeping salt and things like that away and just having a look at it at all else. In terms of ethically disposing of it, that depends where you live. I don't know. Uh, do you take it to a recycling center? Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one, but... I, I wouldn't worry too much about it as long as the bike's being looked after. Also, having bought the bike in 2012 for that price means it would be an excellent bike. With alloy bikes, my understanding is that it should last a long time. And 
ultimately you're going to know if there's something wrong with it. To, to, to simplify it massively is if you took a Coca-Cola can made out of aluminium and you fold it, and you kept folding it again and again and again, same place. After about 10 folds or so, it'll just crack or snap in half. And that's exactly what it is. So essentially, it's the more you ride it, the more pressure you put through it and weight and power. The bike has many flexes all the time, and eventually those flexes just become too much for it. So it will crack eventually. The, the benefit, I think, of alloy as well, though, is in theory, if one of your stays cracks, the bike isn't going to just, like, fall to pieces, or it's unlikely that it would crumble into pieces underneath you. That's a dangerous thing for me to say yes or no. In theory, yes. Um, but listen out for it. Generally, with, as a, from a bike shop's perspective, what we've noticed is if you get a bike that creaks a lot and you've done everything, seat posts, quick release axles, bottom bracket, then all the usual suspects and the bike still creaks while riding it, you start looking for cracks in the frame. So uh, generally speaking, and with past experience, it'll be the bike will start making horrible noises before it snaps. Or at the run, the dropouts is probably the most common. You'll start seeing like the paint bubbling. And there's, yeah, that, that's quite a sign that something's going wrong. I, th I think, it, I guess it depends as well is if you're maintaining these bike, if you're maintaining the bike yourself, you're less likely, I would imagine you're less likely to notice if something is really wrong with it. The beauty of using a good reputable bike shop is, you know, if I was taking that bike into you to service every year, you're going to know, either it's going to be a case of there's a lot of creaks that you can't solve, therefore it might be something else, or you're as part of, you know, doing the annual service on it or however often you do the service on it that you notice, oh, actually, do you know what? There's a hairline crack on this, this BB or the BB doesn't sit right. Actually, it's because there's a crack there. So I guess there, there's, again, an argument for using a good, reputable local bike shop that knows what they're doing because you're more likely to notice, like identify and, these things. And it's the same thing as the Shimano crank set failures. It's just moisture getting in and it's causing issues with the alloy. Keep sending in your questions, stories, and fun stuff to wildonespodcast at cavemedia.co.uk. If you liked the episode, please take a moment to leave us a five-star review or leave a like and comment if you're watching on YouTube. It doesn't take long. It helps us to boost the profile of this podcast and to continue to put it out for free. Catch you next time. Bye. Oh, what am I doing? <laughs> I mean, it's going to the <laughs>